afternoon and uh, thank you so much for joining us for this In Conversation series uh, session with Dr Chris Sara, the Director General of the Department of Seniors, Disability and Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Partnerships. Uh, we are on the land of the Turrbal and Yagara people and I'd like to begin by paying my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and as we have members joining us from right across the state, uh, can I welcome you and also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands you're meeting us on from today and also to acknowledge uh, all First Nations people, um, including Dr Sarah, who are joining us today. A big shout out to the QUT Centre for Justice, who has worked in partnership with QCOS to bring the session to you today. A few um, housekeeping items to begin with. Uh, we are uh, broadcasting in uh, Zoom webinar mode. We have um, enabled the question and answer uh, functionality, so you can ask questions all through the session. Uh, I don't promise that we'll get to all of them, but I will certainly do my best. Uh, and the other point to note is um, that we are recording this session. So if that's something you're not into, um, I suggest you might want to drop out now. I'm really uh, absolutely delighted um, to be joined by Dr Chris Sara today um, and by way of introduction, uh, Dr Chris Sara is a Garang Garang uh, Tirubalang man from Bundaberg. Uh, in 1998, he became the first Aboriginal principal at the State School in Cherbourg. Uh, he in his role, he significantly improved the lives of the young people he worked with um, through a strong and smart philosophy, which encourages students to have a positive sense of cultural identity and embrace positive community leadership. Today, he is the Director General, as I said before, and um, in his role, his focus is to improve the social and economic well-being of Queensland seniors, people with a disability and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Queenslanders to enable all of those people to thrive. Now it's uh, currently uh, the end of National Reconciliation uh, Week um, and the theme this year is Be Brave, Make Change. We are really um, absolutely right now in the right moment to talk about making change. Uh, in addition to it being uh, National Reconciliation Week, almost a fortnight ago now, we have our new Prime Minister use his victory speech to announce his full support for Uluru's Statement of the Heart. And it was a perfect time to make that announcement given it was the eve of the fifth anniversary of the Uluru Statement. So in this um, moment together, um, looking at real transformational change um, happening uh, shortly. But I think, first of all, um, I just wanted to note that it is the 30th anniversary of the Mabo decision, which is clearly a very significant milestone for reconciliation in this country. And uh, Chris, I might just ask if you wouldn't mind reflecting on the importance of that um, decision, particularly in light of reconciliation. Yeah, thanks for um, having me, Amy, and delighted to join you at this forum. And hello to all of your um, QCOS members out there who are watching on. Um, it's 30 years since the Mabo decision came down. I remember it very well, even though I was only six at the time. Um, <clears throat> people might crunch the numbers and come up with a different idea, but it was a very significant time um, in that it was, it was the institution of government recognising the institution of cultural authority uh, and a cultural authority that it has existed for thousands of thousands, thousands and thousands of years. Um, up until that point, there was, um, you know, Australia was kind of um, existing upon a lie um, and a pretending that um, nobody was here when uh, Governor Philip turned up and stuck a flag in the, in the ground. Um, so it was recognition um, in the most profound and in some ways the most, uh, a most basic level um, to right one of the wrongs um, that should never have occurred in the first place. Mm. And I've heard, I heard this morning some reflections about how um, through the native title process we have had uh, a sort of almost private or um, 
a private truth-telling process because First Nations people through the native title system have been required to continually establish their connection to land. And I guess um, part of what's I get so exciting about what's happening right now in this moment is through treaty, treaty and through um, the Uluru Statement, we will have a truth-telling process that takes away sort of um, some of those covers and allows all of us to hear about those things. Yeah, because you think, as we all reflect on the Mabo decision when it first came down, um, it was at a time where the attitude of the rest of Australia was probably still clinging to the past. Mm. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we were on the cusp, I think, of a a government that was talking about black armband view of history and all of that mm. sort of thing, while at the same time having a holding steadfast to the notion of lest we forget, but then telling us as blackfellas, no, 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 there's no point dragging all of that up again. Um, but the country has shifted quite dramatically. Uh, and you mentioned the Prime Minister's, um, the new Prime Minister's speech, uh, where he reflected on the gift of, um, well, it wasn't his words, but it really is a gift that we as First Nations, Queenslanders, First Nations, Australians, bring to this country and bring to the rest of the world. So I, it was one of the things that struck me about the, the new Prime Minister's speech is that he had articulated what is the gift that we bring to this country and the gift that we bring to the world. Uh, it, it's, it's a privilege to carry the blood of the very first Australians um, and the and to be a descendant of the oldest human existence on the planet. Um, and we've known this all along, uh, and by way of the, the new Prime Minister's speech, it's clear that the rest of Australia is catching on and understanding just how rich and how, how much of a treasure this gift truly is. Well, one would argue that, well, I would argue that we've known this all along, um, but it's nice that the rest of Australia is starting to recognise such things, and we couldn't say that we couldn't say that that level of awareness existed 30 years ago. Mm. But things change, and uh, I think it makes for very exciting times ahead. So, if we can go to Queensland mm. um, now and, and talk a bit about treaty. So, it was July 2019 when the Queensland government announced uh, their commitment to a treaty process for. Um, for the government to work with First Nations Queenslanders and non-Indigenous Queenslanders toward a treaty. Chris, would you mind um, talking to us a bit about what a treaty is? Sure. Um, I, and I'll say this, um, you, you know, we, I, I never really aspired to be a Director General of a government department. Um, and fair to say at some stage had active kind of interest in not ever being a public servant again. Um, but from the outset, I, I want to say that I really love the work that I'm doing and I love the job that I'm in because of these really big things that are that are happening, you know. Um, when I, when I, I think of, um, when I think of my old people, these were things that we talked about but never really imagined that they would come to fruition. And so here's me in a very important role, um, setting about a range of things to deliver on the things that we talked about, um, you know, for, for decades and decades and decades. When I watched my, when I was growing up watching my mum and all of the old people around her talking about the need for systemic change. And, um, and here we are. On, on the cusp of systemic change that's quite profound. So when you look to things like a treaty, and you know, your question is what, what is it or what, uh, um, the answer could be complex or, or the answer could be quite simple, you know, but uh, from the outset, it's a recognition that we're here as First Nations Queenslanders, um, that we've, we're here and we have been here all along. And as a consequence of recognising that um, one must recognise our sense of sovereignty uh, and that sense of sovereignty was never given up. We didn't fight a war and lose our right or our connection to our country. You know, you talked about my country earlier, Gurang Gurang, my grandmother's country, Tarabalang, uh, my grandfather's country in and around Bundaberg. Um, we didn't fight a war and lose. Um, we just adapted and... Um, and we're still here, as we have been for thousands of years. 
And so a treaty brings the prospect of saying, okay, um, we didn't quite get things right at the start, so how do we um, forge an agreement that's going to make right the past right. and where we had some missteps mm. on your side and mine, perhaps, mm. more than your side, but... Um, <laughs> um, and how do we forward some agreement about, you know, we, we accept that um, uh, non-Indigenous Australia is here um, and people have come from all over the, the world and made this into a, a very rich, um, rich in a sense of vibrancy and culture sense. My father included, came from Italy. Um, <clears throat> and that's not going to go backwards. I, I don't know that I would even want it to go backwards. Um, but let's... Let's forge some kind of agreement about how we coexist on this land going into the future. And that might invoke conversations around, OK, what are the sacred sites in and around our country? And let's agree that you don't touch this part, you don't touch that part. Or if that part's going to be developed or dug up or whatever, how do we share in the riches of that? How do our, our people, the descendants of the traditional owners of this area, how do we share in the spoils of that? Um, if we're going to forge that agreement about what the future looks like, how do we agree on measures to ensure that um, the school curriculum is um, embedded with things that we think are important as mm. traditional owners, that every young Australian um, man and woman should, should know about, you know? Um, so it could be a whole range of things. And I think for all of those people watching on and all those people who are nervous about what a treaty means, I, um, it's important to say what it's not, and it's not about a land grab or anything that where people are going to be disadvantaged or lose stuff. Um, it's an opportunity to enhance the relationship in a way that recognises that we're here, recognise and embrace our humanity um, and find uh, a way forward that is um, truly honourable. And you talked before about um, you know, 30 years ago, reflecting on where we were as a society in terms of relationships between our First Nations people and um, non-Indigenous Australians and where we are now. And, you know, having governments at both the state and federal level standing up uh, non-Aboriginal Australians um, really ready to um, do what's required to put us on a different path. Can you um, talk to me a little bit about how we got here? Yeah, I well, I I think it's always useful to reflect on um, Cookie Mabo himself, you know, and the the circumstance that um, saw the emergence of the Mabo decision, that profound decision. Up until that point, uh, he was just he worked. Uh, the story is quite well known, but for those who don't know, he was working as a groundsman at the James Cook University in Townsville. Um, would stop by and have a yarn with uh, people like Henry Reynolds, and then said, um, talked about his country back on his island um, in the Torres Strait. And then uh, Henry Reynolds had said, well, you know, it's not your land. He, and it was kind of like, what are you talking about? Um, and, uh, and that's the conversation that started this, his um, sense of um, wanting to make this injustice, um, this very tragic injustice, make it right, you know, and... Uh, he fought all the way to the High Court and won. Um, and what did he win? Well, he won the recognition of the notion that we were here from the start. You know, our, our ancestors had title over over this country. Um, but prior to that, it was just assumed that Australia was terra nullius, empty land, which is a preposterous kind of assumption. It's so, so very flawed um, and so... Um, kind of lacking in, in any sense of honour and integrity to just pretend. It'd be like me coming to your house and sort of setting up camp on the footpath and then eventually moving down and liking your back shed and moving into there and then eventually kind of booting some of your kids out of the room and moving into there and just but not kind of saying anything um, and then eventually just taking over the whole place. And if you didn't like it, well, you kind of just have to be quiet about that. Um, so it's about trying to make those things right. But at its core, I think it's, it's about um, switching from a, a 
circumstance in the past where our sense of humanity and our sense of cultural vib vibrancy and our sense of existence um, didn't exist. I know that sounds strange, but it is just pretending that we weren't here yeah. and flicking a, witch, a, a switch to say, well, actually, we recognise that you're here um, and we recognise that we've got to make this right. And I think we can make it right. Yeah, but what do you think why, you know, 2019, why did our Queensland government make the decision that that was the right time to start um, the path to treaty? Hmm. I, I think it's just a convergence of circumstances, really, um, and the stars aligning and all of those sorts of sorts of thing. Um, it was always one of those things that had to come. And, you know, I think thankfully we had politicians who figured out that they wanted to be on the right side of history mm. um, because there's no, there was never any stopping, st stopping of this agenda. Even though I talked about our old people not imagining it, uh, it was always going to come because we could not perpetuate such a lie and such an inauthentic and dishonourable kind of circumstance in which our humanity, our, our sense of cultural vibrancy and our very existence was continued to be ignored. Mm. So um, I saw in the news this week, and I'm sure um, some of our members would have seen um, Professor Jackie Huggins, um, ex who was uh, a co one of the co-chairs leading the consultation process um, related to the committee uh, for the treaty, so the committee associated with the treaty, um, was was expressing her frustration about how long it's taking and delays. Um, are we on track to treaty? I mentioned earlier, Amy, that I love my job and if I didn't love it and I didn't feel like we were making progress, I, I wouldn't be here. Um, and we're making progress. Uh, and um, it was always the case, you know, the path to treaty is a profound journey um, and right from the get-go there was always going to be a need for patience uh, on both sides of the, the relationship. Um, and government works in the way that government does, you know, but um, I can assure all of your members out there that there's lots and lots of work going on in the background to ensure that the administrative arrangements are being set in place to deliver on what is a very exciting um, next couple of couple of years, um, and I really love I love that I'm here to be a part of it. So, um, and I'm confident that we'll get there. So, the the report that was handed down in October is being carefully considered, um, and this is a profound journey, um, and it's one that's got to be. Um, delivered in a way that is right, mm. it's more important to get it right than to get it m moving quickly. Mm. But we'll get there. So you were referencing there, I think the um, October 2021 was the formal handover of the Treaty Advancement Committee report, um, which concluded sort of phase two of the consultation process, which gave recommendations to government about how to proceed. Um, can you talk me through a little bit about what phase one included and um, some of the recommendations sure. that government's currently considering? Yeah, phase one was um, when it was announced that um, we would be pursuing this path to treaty and I think one of the things we were deliberate about in Queensland in comparison, and it sets us apart from other other jurisdictions, was that we, we recognise that this is a conversation about all of Queensland and so um, the eminent panel was established to have conversations with all of Queensland um, First Nations Queenslanders and um, non-Indigenous um, Queenslanders to talk about what a treaty might look like uh, if we're going down this, should we go down this track, um, what could it look like, what should it look like, those very broad kind of conversations were, were had and then we moved to stage two which culminated in, in the report that was handed down and that's being considered mm. um, by government and a response to that is imminent. Yeah. Mm. So I, I think that report included three key recommendations. One was around um, the establishment of a First Nations Treaty Institute. Uh, one was around truth telling and hearing. Um, and one was around the establishment of a First Nations Treaty Fund. And I think that 
300 million was um, already announced last year in, in the last state year's budget. budget yes. Yeah, so yeah. we're sort of waiting on a formal response in relation to the establishment of the institute and what the tr truth-telling mechanism might look like. Yeah, and I don't think there's any surprises in those yeah. kind of key themes that have yeah. emerged. Uh, and these are these are key themes that are emerging. We saw that in the Uluru Statement and, um, and in other jurisdictions across Australia. So, um, yeah, we're ready to go. And um, as soon as the announcements are made, I think we're in for an exciting next couple of years. And so we have these sort of two very um, complementary pieces happening at a state and a federal level. Um, so in relation to our treaty process here in Queensland, um, you know, it could comprise of the establishment of um, the Treaty Advancement Committee, uh, sorry, of the First Nations Treaty Institute, um, the truth-telling um, and hearing part and obviously ultimately to treaty. And then with the Uluru Statement, we... Um, you know, the steps, um, as I understand it, at the Commonwealth level are to enshrine um, a First Nations voice to Parliament in the Constitution, uh, followed then by um, the Makarata Commission to allow for the truth-telling process and to supervise um, treaty making. So sort of two bits overlaying and as um, members are asking us, our live audience is asking us at the moment as well as diverging opinions about which bits should come first, truth telling or voice. Can you comment a little bit about how the state and um, Commonwealth pieces complement each other and work together or will they be separate Yeah, I've watched some work? commentary on whether one should come before the other or... or um or in what order or, or that kind of thing. I, I've never been one to be hung up on such um, sequencing. I, I kind of think we can walk and chew gum and brush our hair at the same time kind of thing. And um, given the way government works and given the way the political pendulum swings, um, you've got to go where the energy is. Um, and if it means we can if we can set about delivering on all three of those key themes simultaneously, then we should give that a crack. Um, you just got to go where the energy is. But my belief is we can, um, yeah, we're, we're in for a, a profound shift across Queensland and we can do it in whatever, um, wherever the energy is, we can go there and make the change that's required. And the processes, I guess, like I, just in terms of it, envisioning how it might occur if you're having a commitment to truth-telling at a state level and a commitment to truth-telling at a commonwealth level, would those pieces of work be complementing each other? Yeah, it's a good question because um, particularly given the shift in the political um, um, circumstances federally, um, the, the challenge is to um, understand the key themes, um, understand that work has progressed on some of those key themes at a state level. And so you don't want one to stifle the other. And I, I think it's it's really just a matter of swapping notes to say, look, this is where we're at on this and that. And um, we understand what your agenda is. And if it can be dovetailed to enhance your agenda and ours, mm. that would be a good thing. Um, those conversations, whilst um, they're big conversations, I, I don't think they need to be that complex. And so with a Makarata Commission at a federal level um, sort of overseeing treaty making processes, would that be a treaty at a commonwealth level and then we would have treaties at each, at each in each state and territory? Possibly, yeah. I think that they are, they are things to be worked out. Yeah. Um, but we, there is def definitely a need to um, understand the commonwealth's agenda, uh, for them to understand where we as Queensland want to move and what progress we've made already mm. uh, and work out how we can, how one can enhance the other. Uh, it's absolutely doable. Mm. Mm. So during the first phase of the consultation, um, the treaty working group went all around the state and um, I've read that in all 24 locations, First Nations people um, voiced um, a desire for um, services to be more aligned with the needs and aspirations of First Nations people. Um, 
I wondered whether, given that we are, um, you know, the service sector, social services sector, um, and we uh, we feel on the hook, I guess, in mm. re in relation to that, um, how would you say um, services could um, better meet the needs of First Nations people, and how can our sector support? the treaty making process? Yeah, it's a good question, Amy, and it's one that you know, obviously your members should have a strong interest in. Um, and it's worth understanding that whilst the, the treaty agenda is is um, is being considered by government at this time, there's a whole range of other work that's happening in and around service delivery and service mm. reform, particularly at a local level. So we've been running what is the Local Thriving Communities Agenda, mm. which is about investing in and embracing local community leadership. And it's about um, bringing forward local Aboriginal leadership, local Torres Strait Islander leadership, and ensuring that they can have a say in how um, how we, we as government do service delivery and service design mm. in local communities. Now, mm. um, that stuff's been happening for the last couple of years and we've seen the emergence of uh, local decision-making bodies uh, in some of our remote and discrete communities and it's our intention to um, see the emergence of local decision-making bodies in other provincial and metropolitan areas. And that's a conversation that doesn't have to be stalled or wait for the treaty agenda to be considered and progressed. Um, that's a conversation that's been happening already. I mean, uh, we, we, there's a local decision-making body in the community of Marpoon, for instance, and they've been um, frustrated with how we do service delivery and service design in terms of policing in their community. Mm. But now that they'd formed as a group, they were able to assert an interest in having a, a better police presence in Ma in Mapoon and um, they've got a police liaison person and they were able to achieve that by consolidating their voice at a local level mm. and by us and as Queensland government embracing that voice at a local level. Um, and those conversations are around service, as I said, service delivery and service design and how we deliver education, health, um, justice and all other sort of service delivery measures at a local level. And that's really a conversation for for us as government to have with local Aboriginal leadership and local Torres Strait Islander leadership. My personal view is that the treaty conversation is, is a conversation with traditional owners um, mm. about how we choose to how we agree to coexist on this land. So, mm. for me, you know, my home country is. Um, Bundaberg, mm. uh, that's Tarabalang and Gurangarang is just north of there. So uh, me personally, I might be involved in treaty conversations, so I'd have to take my government hat off, of course, but I might seek to be involved in um, treaty conversations for my country, mm. but because I don't live there anymore, I wouldn't necessarily be involved in local thriving communities yeah. conversations because that's about service delivery and service design that's happening in a place that I don't live in, you know, I live in Caboolture, I might be in, involved there. And mm. so when government, I guess, is contracting um, community organisations to deliver services in community, then how does government make sure that those views, preferences, ideas expressed in local communities that government is taking on board, that that is passed on through their procurement processes and how do we as a sector make sure that we actually um, being, we can hear um, those voices and ensure that our service delivery and design reflects those views. And yeah, I, th I think for, for you and all of your members is just be aware of the local thriving communities agenda and mm. our very strong commitment to embrace local uh, Aboriginal leadership and local Torres Strait Islander leadership to ensure that they have a say in um, how we do service delivery, how we do service design, who wins contracts to do service delivery. You know, Amy, one of the things that um, frustrates, has frustrated me a lot, and I'm sure your members have seen this a lot, is when you'll get some organisation um, who who is fantastic at writing submissions or tendering to win mm. government contracts to do stuff in local communities, and they come to Brisbane and they razzle-dazzle the minister or they razzle-dazzle my colleagues. Um, so they're great at um, writing the submissions to win the contracts because they're geared for that but hopeless at being connected to local community mm. and um, 
and at a community level, you've got these grassroots organisations who are magnificent at being connected to local community and have their finger on the pulse mm. in a very authentic way. Um, but they haven't got time to be geared to write the submissions, mm. to win the contracts, to do the stuff. And we've got to fix that, mm. and we're hoping to fix that through this local thriving communities agenda so that we don't have these um, people come razzle-dazzle the politicians and then they, they, they either turn up to community and community and saying, so who are you, what are you doing mm. here? Um, or they win the big multi-million dollar contracts and then they engage the... Um, those local grassroots organisations, but they're only getting 20 cents in the original dollar mm. because the chunk of that money is going elsewhere. Mm. I think there are some things about the relationship that we can fix up along the uh, along the way. Mm. So there's sort of um, at a Queensland level, so three overlapping pieces that I'm hearing is um, the thriving um, Queensland communities um, partnership piece which is about local communities coming together forming um, a leadership group and being able to um, provide um, well exercise self-determination within their own community about what happens in their community service government services that are delivered in their community um, and then there's the separate to that the treaty process which is mm -hmm. um, about um, government working um, with First Nations people and non-Indigenous people, but you're saying traditional owners. Um, uh, and I should stress that's a. a we'll, we'll see what yeah, um, yeah. other people have a different and view about. And that's more that. about mm. coexistence, the treaty Correct. process, yeah. agreement, and coexistence, yeah. and shared benefits, and making right the past, and you know? making right mm. the past. And then there would be a third element which we haven't touched on yet, which would be a voice to Queensland's Parliament. Yeah. Um, mm. Is that something that's on the table? Well, again, we reflect with, probably showing my colours, but we reflect on with enthusiasm on the ch change in federal government. I probably said too much there, but um, there was that commitment to embrace the Uluru st Statement, and a feature of that was the sense of voice. Mm. Um, and we're very keen on that at, at, a, at a state level as well. So we're very keen to understand, similar to what we talked about with the treaty agenda about, mm. okay, what is the Commonwealth ag agenda? We've, we've um, <coughs> put s um, some measures in place to, well, we certainly contemplated what voice should, what delivering on the notion of voice should look like in Queensland. Um, earlier I talked about the local um, th uh, th thriving communities agenda and that's about ensuring voice at a community mm. level um, when it comes to service delivery mm. and service design. And I think there's other, other levels at which we can contemplate what voice means um, when it comes to policy delivery and policy design and things like closing the gap mm. targets and holding us as government to account mm. um, for the pursuit of those measures and all of those sorts of sorts of things. So from my perspective, there's this conversation with traditional owners um, about the treaty conversations where we can make good the past and agree on how we coexist on the land that we share into the future. Mm. There's this uh, conversation about uh, local thriving communities and how we ensure more effective service delivery and service design through embracing local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership. And then there's this other level of enabling voice to ensure adequate input into policy design and policy delivery and holding us to account as, go as government. So it's voice at that level and voice at that level. And so I wonder, um, you know, I think as service providers, um, many of us would be concerned about the things um, that we're seeing um, on the ground each day in terms of... Um, poverty and disadvantage um, and it's not to diminish the importance of um, voice or the importance of treaty but to sort of think about how we address in the immediate sort of term the disadvantage that we're seeing families and children. Um, yeah but let, let me give you an example of um, that because a, a lot of people out there in the mm. general population are saying these these things, okay, they sound important and they're big themes, but how are they going to deliver change mm. in communities? Well, they have the potential, particularly the embracing local community leadership, um, to give them a sense of voice and a sense of um, empowerment to decide who wins government contracts mm. or who wins 
the right to do service delivery in, mm. in communities. There is, a, there is a potential for a profound impact to occur. There, I already talked about the Mapoon um, example where um, they have a, a police and a community police presence more consistently in Mapoon. So what does that mean? It means if things spike or a little, get a little bit out of hand in the community, the health workers don't go, so they've got a continuing um, health service there because things are uh, remaining settled. Another community um, rings up a very senior executive in my department and says, um, it was, a, it was a, um, a provider, somebody who'd won a, won a massive contract for several hundred thousand dollars over a couple of years to deliver mental health services in a, in a particular community, which I won't name, but it was Commonwealth dollars and ringing a senior executive in my department to say, we've got to do something about this because they're talking about cutting our funding off. And um, my colleague says, well, let me leave it with me. I'll ask some questions and find out. So he rings people in that particular community and says, how, how are these folks going? You know, their, their funding's looking like getting cut off. And the response was, we don't even know who these people are. Um, so when you can... When you can give local people a say, then they're more inclined to ask the questions that need to be asked. Because, all right, well, if we're going to give this organisation a couple of hundred thousand dollars to come and do service delivery in our community, whether it's for child protection or mental health or aged care or whatever, um, they get to prosecute um, the adequacy of that service provision. And they can say, well, that mob... They only just fly in and fly out. And actually what they're doing, we've got people in community who can do that. So we don't need people flying in from Brisbane or Cairns. Mm -hmm. We'd rather that money is invested locally in this organisation mm -hmm. who are all blackfellas who can do that, that work. So we'd rather see the money and the contract go to those people mm -hmm. and we'd be more confident because they employ more, more local people. They don't fly in, fly out. They live in the community. They have their finger in the, on the pulse. Mm -hmm. um, so... I get why people run to that sense of um, thing and it's kind of cool to do that, to try to shoot down the agenda or undermine the agenda. But by making these profound kind of shifts and ways of adjusting the relationship, we really can make a profound difference in a tangible way mm. at a community level. Mm. Um. So Queensland has a Human Rights Act mm -hmm. and it does include um, protection of uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people's cultural rights. It gives, uh, it references the right to self-determination but it doesn't actually protect the right to self-determination. Um, the Act will be reviewed in the not too distant future. Do you think um, our human rights protections are adequate or whether there's scope to increase the human rights protections of our First Nations people in law? Yeah, look, I think the Human Rights Act is, is relatively new um, and it, it brings on um, complexities, as it should, uh, and it causes us as government to have to deeply consider how we're doing business. And I know that in, across all of government, these conversations and these considerations have to be made. You know, in the, in the area of um, cultural vibrancy and cultural rights, um, we're in the midst of a cultural heritage review and that review has been seen qu quite good levels of engagement. Part of that is taking into account its impact on the human rights, or how it, how it, in, how it interplays with the Human Rights Act, um, and we've got to respond to that. So I can't say specifically too much about that at the moment, but it's good that we're having to grapple with those sorts of, sorts of challenges. Um, but it's new and we've got to find a way forward um, because it's the right thing to do. Mm. And do you think... In terms of the right to self-determination, you know, one option would be to protect it in the Human Rights Act. But do you think that treaty and voice um, actually are vehicles for self-determination in themselves? Yeah, I believe that absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, and it's it's one of those things that at some level it's complex, but at other levels it's quite simple. You know. Um, and it's nice to be a part of a government that's trying to take those challenges um, seriously and grapple with, with the complexities that it inevitably brings. Um, but we wade through that and we figure out a way forward. It's, it's what we have to do. 
So back to the, um, you know, the, the, the Commonwealth level, I guess, and the exciting reforms that's happening there. I, from what's been put forward by the Uluru Statement, um, the first step would be uh, a referendum to enshrine a voice to parliament um, in the Commonwealth Constitution. Um, I think it was in April um, this year, uh, there was a gathering of the Uluru Dialogue and they issued the Yarrabah Affirmation, which suggested two possible dates for the, um, for the referendum. One is um, May 27, 2023, and the other date is January the 27th, 2024. I'm interested to hear whether you think, as a nation, think you know when we consider where we've been and where we're at, whether we are, as a nation, are ready for that referendum. I, I have a reasonably strong view on such things, but ultimately, it's a it'll be a question for government to consider, um, and what they'll need to consider at the time is whether the country is ready for it. it um, my personal view is that right now there's a lot of work um, that needs to be done, but it's a bit like the treaty conversations. It's more important to get it right. Um, and I'm inclined to think that w there's a need to kind of slow the conversation down to get to enable that strategic momentum so that we can take all of the country with us. Um, and at the moment, it seems clear that despite the kind of questionnaires or surveys, online surveys that are put up, I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely persuaded that that's enough to lock in a date um, as nominated. I, I think our energy is better spent on um, enabling the strategic momentum to get the conversations going and get the right, the, get the people who are on the other side of the argument on the right side of the argument. And that's going to take time um, because we don't, and this is well known, you know, we don't want to storm the castle on this issue. We want to get Australians, um, all Australians, comfortable with the idea um, because Australians are not the kind of people who are going to vote yes in a referendum um, that says, just vote yes for now and we'll fix the detail later on. That's not going to happen. I, 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 I just can't see that happening and I think it's too... I think it's naive to believe otherwise. Um, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's worthwhile slowing down, enabling this strategic momentum, and getting a good sense of getting taking the country and getting it, furnishing our understanding so that all Australians are where they need to be on this question, um, and then considering um, putting it to a vote. So this could be a question you don't want to answer, but. Um it's, you know, when you think about that strategy to get us to a place where we can, uh, the w referendum could be successful, um, some would say that we need to start within um, government, so you need bipartisan support for the referendum in the first place. And then really what you've been talking about as well is that um, sort of consensus building um, or support building within the community. Do you think the focus should be on that political alignment to begin with? Or do you think at some point we need to move beyond that political conversation and open it up to the community and put more focus on actually allowing the com bringing the community along? Oh, yeah, I think it's that, but it's also getting on and doing some of the doing yeah. um, and offering up in a legislative sense what enabling voice looks like. I mean, earlier I talked about um, what enabling voice looks like at a community level and what it looks like at a level of um, contemplating policy delivery and policy de design. Mm. We can actually get on and do some of those things now. We don't need a constitutional shift to enable that. And I know a lot of people out there uh, who are advocates of going hard and fast at this um, are reticent because of the, the way that ATSIC was abolished mm. back in the day. Um, but I don't know that it's... Um, I don't know that it's um, useful to make similar comparisons because the ATSIC thing was abolished in a, in a time and in an Australia that was somewhat different to what it is today. Um, and I think that um, governments have shifted, you know, um, we are talking about voice, we are talking about 
treaties, we are talking about um, enabling truth-telling, all of those kinds of things. So there's, there's ways that we can get on and do some of the doing to demonstrate what enabling voice looks like at a community level and at a, at a higher level. Um, and once we, once we give the country and the rest of Australia something tangible to look upon and think, oh yeah, that's not, you know, that's, that's actually quite good, you know, it's quite effective and we can see what change that's bringing. So why wouldn't we enable that or uh, uh, cause a shift in our constitution and vote yes for, to enshrine those arrangements in a constitution? So I guess the other bit then would be how do you, so you spend the time to develop the right um, mechanism um, and then you put it to the Australian people um, and you sort of then said, and then the Australian people consider it and hopefully think that's a good idea. And But what is that process um, when you're working with our Australian community right across the country with both First Nations and non-Indigenous um, Australians? What is that process to bring us all toward um, a consensus or a majority yes? Yeah, I, th I think it's as I said. I mean, it's about establishing those t sort of tangible measures and enabling or bringing about that systemic change, you know, uh, enabling local decision-making bodies, um, establishing, um, you know, I look, I look to the example of the um, uh, ACT and their Indigenous elected body. Yeah. Um, and it's the perfect example of yeah. enabling voice at that policy design, policy delivery, holding government to account. It's quite a good idea. And if we can point to that and say, look, this is tangible, this is how it manifests in positive outcomes and all of those sorts of things. This is kind of the thing we're talking about. So over the next couple of years, if we can emulate that or, or bring about our own kind of arrangements that sort of um, are tangible and, and we can point to, um, then I think that makes us, uh, puts us on fertile ground to consider um, constitutional change. Yeah. So um, in Queensland, we're sort of waiting currently for the, for the Queensland government to uh, respond to whether they will establish um, a First Nations Treaty Institute um, and what or if there will be a truth-telling process. What exactly would the role of the First Nations Treaty Institute be? Yeah, look, I think we'll have to wait for the announcements to be made. Um, and uh, I can assure you that there's lots and lots of work going on in the background to be ready for when those announcements are to be made. I don't want to preempt what the government has to say about such things, but all I can say is I really love my job at the moment and I'm excited about where we can go um, over the next couple of years. And that, that, treaty, um, that treaty institute won't be a decision-making body, will it? It's not like what you've just described in the ACT. No, I think it's... And Minister Crawford made this distinction, which is useful, is that up until, up until now um, and, and into the future, the process has been about um, establishing what a treaty process should look like. Um, it hasn't been about forging actual treaties with, yeah. say, the Tarabalang people or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. That will come. Um, it's, yeah, we're in a period now where we've, we've got to contemplate, okay, what does the process look like? How should it be set up? How should it be designed? How do we get government ready for this? But um, the, I'm sure the Premier will make more announcements about that at the right time. So, uh, Dr. Sarah, I know you were only six uh, when the Mabo decision was made, um, mm. and but I hope I'm not revealing too much about you when I say you're a granddad. Yes, <laughs> yes. Can you tell me? Possibly the most gorgeous granddaughter <laughs> on the planet, but I'm a bit like biased. I'm sure Can she I is. just confess, I wasn't six at the time. <laughs> I was probably B big reveal. Yeah, 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 I'm 54, 55 yeah. this year. So, so your mm. granddaughter. You know, yes. just thinking about the moment we're in mm. and uh, the transformational change that we can imagine right now because you're talking about your old people and mm. them imagining and you now being in the moment where the dreams are coming true. Mm. What are your dreams for your granddaughter and what do you want her, um, mm. what do you want her to be living 
when she's your age? Wow. Um, I wasn't expecting that question, um, but it's a good question. I just want her um, to just be in a community and a nation where her sense of cultural vibrancy is honoured and embraced and loved and um, she can embrace it with a sense of love and enthusiasm and all that comes with that and understand very well um, that it is truly a gift to carry the blood of the first Australians, the oldest continuing human existence on the planet and that it is a gift and it's one that she will bring to her community. Uh, she'll bring it to Queensland and to the rest of the nation and then we bring that gift to the rest of the world. So um, I compare that to when I grew up in Bundaberg in the 1970s <laughs> when Joe Bianchi Peterson, remember him, was the Premier, my goodness gracious me. Um, and we were, we lived in a community that um, sometimes actively tried to teach us that we were inferior because we were Aboriginal. Um, and thankfully, I had a very proud, very hard-working Italian father and a very fiercely proud Aboriginal mother who got us to understand otherwise and got us to understand the gift that we, that we bring to the rest of, of the nation. Um, and so we were able to transcend those challenges. Um, but it wasn't easy, Amy, and I just, I know that my granddaughter is going to um, be in a community where she can um, just and enjoy and embrace her sense of cultural vibrancy and love that for what it truly is. Yeah, that's... I think that's what I look forward to for her. And she will she will have that, yeah. as will the new grandson that's on the way as well. Mm. That's mm. amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. And yeah. um, can I say... Gosh, you, didn't, you didn't warn me about that. Um, you told me all the other questions you were going to ask me, but you caught me off guard there. Mm. Well, can I say thank you? Mm. Thank you for the gift that you bring us um, through your journey your experience your wisdom and your generosity in terms of sh what you share with us and um, also your amazing optimism for the future it's infectious and it's just a real pleasure um, to have had the opportunity to talk to you so thank you dr chris sarah thank you amy and thanks to all of your members out there um, you guys do really great work and really important work and um, thank you to everyone online who's joining us. Um, happy Friday. Uh, I do hope um, you'll join us for our next In Conversation, um, which will be with the Treasurer on the 23rd of June in person um, at our budget breakfast. I think we've got a small handful of tickets left. Uh, so if you do want to come, um, please get online and book your ticket now. And also, if you haven't seen our lineup for our conference, you are missing out. Uh, the conference is um, over the 6th and 7th of September. Um, Grace Tame will be there. Amy Ramikas will be there. Uh, Minister Di Farmer will be giving a keynote. Uh, and we are going to have our amazing uh, Community Impact Awards. Um, first ever uh, at our awards um, night dinner, our conference dinner. It's going to be really fun. Uh, and I really hope I see as many of you there as possible. Again, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Sarah, and uh, have a fabulous weekend.